So good afternoon. Welcome to our study session this afternoon for the High School School District Board of Directors. We will have a presentation today on the boundary process. A little update on the things that have happened. So did you want to say anything, Michelle? We'll just turn it over to Dr. Reyes. All right. So Dr. Susana Reyes will start the presentation today. Okay. I'm going to get myself situated here really quick. So I guess I changed my mind. Well, oh. um, <laughs> that's why Susana is getting ready. Uh, I guess what I wanted to do is just provide a little bit of a brief umbrella for the board um, in terms of what to expect from tonight's presentation. So um, Susana and Spencer are here to walk us through kind of a background where the Boundary Vision Committee has been. Um, you have uh, at least one member, may, oh, multiple members from the committee in the audience tonight. Um, so what Susan is prepared to do is kind of go over some background, talk a little bit about guiding principles, share with the board where your prioritization of guiding principles landed from our last meeting, and then have you engage in a very similar activity to that that was done with the broader community um, so that you as a board can really know and understand where we've been so far in terms of consideration of um, the boundary revision process and then she'll Susanna will end with some next steps so yeah ready to go yes awesome all right well welcome everybody um, good evening president Christensen members of the board and superintendent Whitney this afternoon's study session is on the boundary revision work so it's an update for you um, just as um, Superintendent Whitney shared. As you know, the Boundary Committee uh, began working and meeting in July and it includes parents, community members, and staff. In October, we enlisted the support of JUB engineers, and Spencer Montgomery is here this evening with us again today, to assist with some of the more detailed analysis of the data. And we had a board study session in November and follow-up committee meetings in November and December. So at the end of November, three community meetings were held where parents, staff, and, and um, community members reviewed three draft boundary scenarios for elementary and middle school. Feedback was shared via a form that could be completed at the meetings or online, and all of the scenarios were posted online as well, um, and along with the form. Approximately 140 people attended in total. Um, the meetings and then over 125 forms were submitted and um, in addition to that we had information shared at um, parent conferences at um, Curie and Whittier um, some of the boundary scenarios had some potential changes for some of our neighborhoods that um, attend school there so we wanted to make sure that we reached out to them and then I also presented information at our bilingual PAC meeting um, about the scenarios and, and um, offered an opportunity for, for parents there to provide feedback as well. Okay. These are the guiding principles that were developed back in May as a result of the survey and your board study session that took place. And then on November 13th, that study session, you further prioritized the guiding principles. We um, set aside the foundational guiding principles that are um, at the bottom of the slide there because those are foundational and um, we, there was no need to prioritize those. Those were critical. Um, but the other guiding principles, um, we wanted to give you another opportunity to um, further prioritize those to help guide the, the work as, as we went along. Um, and this table is a result of that process, and you also have it there in front of you for your reference as we move forward this, this evening. So at this time, we're going to have you review the elementary draft boundary scenarios that were shared at the community meetings, and you have those in a packet in front of you. They're long 11 by 17 documents. And we'll have you discuss and offer your insights and feedback. Um, you also have a, a data table uh, that provides information about each of the scenarios that include um, enrollment and uh, school capacities, et cetera. And before we have you um, break up into small groups, perhaps we'll have Spencer Montgomery provide you a little bit of background that he also shared at the community meeting so that um, you have a sense of kind of how that process played out and have give you an opportunity to partake. Spencer. I thought it might be <clears throat> a little bit helpful 
to preface what we presented to the public for you to kind of catch up to where, where we are today. Uh, we met with you a month ago, showed you a few maps and some of the knowledge that we had gained as we reviewed the, the data of where the students live and where they go to school and those kinds of things. The day after we met with you, we met with the Boundary Committee, shared all those tools with them as well, shared with them your prioritization, and then with them developed three scenarios. And then said we, we want to take these at the public and, and we want to basically generate a table similar to what you have in front of you that shows what the number of students would be at each school. And they said we'd like to see that before it goes to the public. So we met with them again, reviewed the whole thing, made sure everybody was comfortable with it, uh, because it's, it's important that you understand what's going to the public, very, very important. And so, so then we took it to the public for, the, for three community meetings that were held, and they had a feedback form that they could provide feedback. So I'd like to explain a little bit to you. Each of you have a set of the maps, and I wanted to, to just review with you briefly what some of the things are on the map, similar to how we explained it to the public. So that, so that they had a little bit of background to understand you know, what we're doing and how we got there and, and what we are hoping to get from them. Uh, so the, the shaded areas in, in kind of the, I'll call them the pastel colors, those are the existing school boundaries. And then each scenario has, and these are for elementary schools, existing elementary school boundaries, and then the, the darker lines on one scenario there kind of a pinkish color, another scenario they're blue, and, and the scenario see they're green, showed what the that scenario's boundaries would be. Um, within, within those boundaries, um, you will see some smaller neighborhood breakdowns, and there's some, a number like a, a T-1, and then a number in parentheses, and that shows the number of estimated students to be in that neighborhood in the year 2020, uh, opening of, of school 2020. And the reason why that was important was it, it helps us, helps everybody to kind of understand, okay, what if we move this neighborhood into a different uh, elementary school under a certain scenario, they can have an estimate kind of how many students that might be. Uh, we also explained to them that those, the numbers include the estimated growth due to development based upon plats and preliminary plats, the information that we got from the city. And we showed you a map of, of red dots, you'll remember, last month that, that accounts for that. We also explained to them that the, the estimates of future student population within the boundaries also accounts for what we're calling migration due to the programs that are offered. So students that may live in one boundary school that attend a school somewhere else where, uh, for instance, the bilingual program or dual language program spectrum at the Russian bilingual, all of, the, all of that is accounted for in our estimates for, for the 2020 forecasted numbers. One other thing that's important about the neighborhood is that on the feedback form, we asked them t to tell us what neighborhood they lived in so that we can understand the specific concerns and issues by the neighborhood. If, if a whole neighborhood came out, excuse me, and said, you know, a certain thing and they were consistent in that, it would be nice to know that so that we can try to honor their, those types of requests as best we can. Um, so we, we didn't, didn't do a lot of, uh, I mean, that's basically the extent of the education that we gave them because we wanted them to have time to ask questions. And so we had a number of our boundary committee members there <laughs> and staff and myself were there to answer questions as people reviewed these three alternatives. And so our intent now is to continue the input process and, and have you all review the information that the public had the opportunity to do. And then we're gonna take that feedback along with continued feedback that we need to get from, from others through the process. Uh, and, then, and then we'll take all of that. And, and what we told the public was, we don't expect that any of these alternatives, A, B, or C, is gonna be the one that's ultimately gonna be adopted. We expect to take all the feedback, uh, synthesize it, and, and balance those guiding principles as best we can to come up with a scenario that, that best m meets the needs of, of the capacity that's going to be provided through the, the new schools that are being built. So I think we're going to take a few minutes at least here for you to review the materials that you have and, and ask questions just like the public did and, and uh, provide your feedback um, and, and we'll go that way for a little while. I, 
I should ask Susanna too as well. And you understand this at the at the last meeting, you had asked us to update the capacities that we're showing on these tables to reflect the reduced class size, and that's what that's what the capacities that you see there show. We had initially thought about perhaps having you work in pairs. Um, I'll defer to Superintendent Whitney to see if we want to structure the the work this evening a certain way or review the information at your seat and then maybe engage in general conversation. What would be the... I prefer to have our small group be all of us because yeah. when we divide up then I feel like I'm missing out what the board members or other board members are thinking. So if that's okay, I, I yeah. would prefer that. So. As we discuss, if we can hear what everyone has to say, we're not too big of a group. Okay. So I'm looking at this and we're, we're the only reason we're changing boundaries on the, on the uh, east side of Pasco is to pick up that little block from Captain or that's uh, currently at McGee and moving that to an east side school. Is that right? I, I understand. I'm just saying that the only thing that's happening on that side that's changed from as far as moving any students to the new schools is we're, we're instead of moving people to the west, we're moving McGee east. Is there anything else that's changing? Because I'm not, do we have Twain students on there? Well, when, when sixth grade moves back to the middle school. Right. It gives us an opportunity to, to recreate the neighborhood schools in the central and And so we kind of taken the puzzle and shifted some of them around to put them back at their school that's closest to them. So yeah. like the neighborhood I, homes, I mean, I, 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 I totally understand. I, I just want to make sure that I'm, I understand yeah. the desire to move people back to their neighborhoods. It just, we're building schools on the west side and we're moving students east. That's what's it's just the one neighborhood because right. it's close. Right. Right. And it's right. Five kids. It was, maybe it was more when it originally went to the Oh, there's only five kids. I didn't even notice that. 
in that neighborhood. That's what the parentheses wow. stands for. Yeah. So that small of a number, you could probably allow them to stay, right? I mean, you could allow that. Yeah, I'm I would just, think that that a number should be allowed to be grandfathered in or not move if they didn't. My only comment would be, are, do we really need to rearrange all these boundaries other than move those five kids somewhere? I, and I don't, or I guess there's 17, no? There's five, because that 17 is already incorporated in another one. Are we getting better balance among schools for, by doing that? And it allows for better, closer to a neighborhood school. Okay. numbers that show the the rate of growth are they not pictured on this because some of these are like way under and some of them are considerably over is that because we feel like those are they, those are going to have less growth in them or um, what do you mean by um, under what um under capacity and over capacity of the schools for the school i know we have the growth numbers before um and those growth numbers are included in, in each of the neighborhoods. Okay. So it kind of depends on where you draw the boundaries as to whether they're going to be over or under. But with the new capacity, you can see at the bottom of that, of, of like this right column here, uh -huh. the, that bottom number shows the additional capacity that there would be with the existing portable. Okay, now the goal would be to take this middle column here, the, the capacity with the brick and mortar, the goal would be to fit all of the kids in there, right? Right. And it, it says that there's basically 180 more kids than what you can fit in the brick and mortar if you could find a way to fit them all in the right school. Right. Okay, so that's that's kind of challenging, but, but <laughs> most of them, many of them do fit in there in the school. Yep. Within their brick and mortar, but there's a couple that would need, need to use the portables. And, and you can see there's a couple of red numbers in that column under scenario A, at least, that, that show that there's not even enough portables for them at the time. Based, based upon the boundaries for that scenario. Mm -hmm. So here's my thoughts in looking at it. So for Livingston, I like the uh, scenario B. It just makes sense to me that we, that block L1, who is currently going to Livingston, stay at Livingston. It doesn't make sense to me that we bust them over the freeway. I'm, I'm just, my input there. And if I look at, so how many students is that in scenario B, Livingston 488, yeah, we're over capacity of what we, figures of capacity, but we're considerably less than what we are currently in Livingston. And I like scenario C for Maya Angelo. It just makes sense to me that we take those students down in that corner, down by Lowe's and that behind Walmart and keep them in Angelo. That keeps Angelo at 200 over capacity. So, if we, what is C for Angelo? <laughs> <laughs> well, well not, not, not saying that we shouldn't take some more out. It's just, right. and I, I totally get that, I mean, they're going to go up to Sandifer and what's another block. I just, I know we got a lot of pushback when we had people driving past Franklin to go to McGee when we did this before. So it's at the end of the file. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're
we're gonna we're gonna bring one of the maps up here so I can explain something for you. And, and I think I brushed on this a little bit when we were here a month ago, but just to kind of refresh a little bit. Um, and as you as you look at the numbers, and, and I think the comments that you make, President Christensen, are are reasonable comments, and those are similar to the, to what I would say as well. But. Uh, one of the one of the challenges of that bridge. Do you want me to? I'm going to pull all three of them up, and then you tell me which one uh, to okay. focus on. That way, they're easier to right. just access. Right yeah. Which one would you like? Um, I, th I think C. Okay. So what this, what this does is it makes these, these kids are are in Angelo under every scenario. Right. This one here brings more into Angelo. Right. And what it does then, if you look at the, at the total for number 17 up here, it really leaves these neighborhoods, and it also includes these in the number that's there. The number is only 345. It would be our estimate for or 17. Opening year. Okay, but we understand that there's, there's a new subdivision here, there's a new one here, and there's a big one that's going to be coming over here, right? And they're building homes now. So growth is going to come. It, it might be a little bit awkward to open it with a lot of classrooms and other capacity. So that was, but but we wanted to show that so that we could get comments and, and see how people feel about that. Right? So there's that block right there that is labeled F3. That's 144 students. It's those apartments on uh, Burns or Power Line or whatever it is, mm -hmm. and maybe, and they are currently in Franklin. So. Right. Why don't we send them to the new school? I mean, they're changing schools. Right. Instead of switching some from Angelo to the new school and then taking those kids into Angelo, we could take that block and move them to the new school. I, 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 that's an option. I, I think they would be able to walk there as well. Yeah. I, I agree that, I mean, the school that's going to fill up the fastest is 17, whatever that is. Is that yeah. Columbia River? Oh, yes. Okay. So, and so, I'm. I totally understand the uh, don't fill it up at first. And that has been considered. Right. Was to have that neighborhood over there. I don't think that got into any of our scenarios, but that was actually considered, I think, by the boundary committee before they knew where any of the kids were. So, so that's that's certainly an option that can be considered. And, and in, in my opinion, it might be a meaningful option as well because they they would just be the ones, right? Yep. Uh, from and, a school that they're bus to to a school that they're walking to. And I would take those that are currently in Livingston that are south of the freeway and move them. Or currently in, yeah, and leave them in Livingston. Right. They currently go there. So you'd, you'd be switching, I think that's 50 some, you'd be adding 100 and, is it 140 some? 144 and dropping 57. So net yeah. gain of 90. So, kind of to summarize that, if you if, if we want to use the freeway as an option boundary, which we kind of one of those things that we thought was meaningful, and you wrote 68 as a boundary, there's really not enough kids today, or even forecast in 2020, in this area here that would put you know more than you know 400 in each of those schools. I think. But, but yet you still have the dual language that at hand. So that, that kind of helps to bring the numbers up there as well. But, but the growth is coming. So, so we kind of know, want to know what the community feels about that as well. And I think that once we hear from everything, then we kind of sit down and scratch our heads and say, what's the right balance? I, I think I shared with you uh, over at Kenway, they opened a new school uh, a couple years ago, and they have this capacity, right? So they put a new program in the school, and a couple of years later, they've got new capacity being provided somewhere else. And so they're going through a boundary adjustment again, and they're saying, well, this school's full, and they're building a whole bunch of this uh, home next to it, just like it's going to happen here. And so they're moving some of the neighborhoods from the new school back to the schools that they were at. Yeah. So, but then, you know, from comments that we've received, I parents feel that that's part of it. Yeah, and in that scenario, I mean, it is nice to keep that one group with Livingston, but 
if we put these back to Livingston, that would make elementary 17 even more under. I realize <coughs> that's going to be the most over, um, I mean the most under, because there's the most growth. Um, but I really like the idea of moving this because that helps the numbers in both schools. Um, it creates only 64 over in Angelo for scenario C. If we just move this, and then it makes the Columbia River only 166 under, which probably will accommodate growth there for the next few years, at least several years. Anyway, so so it's hard. Now, obviously, you have a hard job. Which um, one? Is is there a lot of growth in Curie in that area? Yeah. They're building houses right across from Whittier and Curie right now. And we're busing to four different schools to meet our boundary that goes from the Flamingo Village out. Okay. okay. So. That, that's an interesting. I mean, I was looking at that too. Interesting thought to me is we don't have a really good balance between Curie and Whittier. Have we talked about would it make more sense to move second grade over while we're doing all this? Because the ratio balance here is is not anywhere close to equal between Curie and Whittier. We're 275 students under brick and mortar capacity at one school and 62 at the other. So would it make sense to move them for numbers and would it impact anything uh, programmatically if we were to, to balance those two schools out and make a kinder first and a second through fifth? I think the consideration would be reconfiguring two case five, six, seven, eight in two years from now. I'm assuming that that's the intent, right? And then look at reconfiguration at that point. I don't think I completely understood your, your comment. So Scott, Scott's asking, did you consider reconfiguring Whittier Curie? I'm assuming that conversation would happen at the point in which you were talking about going to a K5, uh, uh, six, seven, eight. Right, yes, right. At, the, so, at, at that time. Yeah. Just yeah. because to so, have them so vastly different, we would be always underutilizing our yeah. new school in Curie. Yeah, so I'm sorry, I'm not communicating well. I think it's a great question, and I think yeah. it's one we can write down so that when they dig into what that reconfiguration Timing looks like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah. think the numbers that we show here show three grades yeah. K, yeah. K, K two, three, so, five. so I'm saying, does yes. it make sense to have K one at one school and three through five at the other, or so two, that there three, is more utilization mm -hmm. of five, yeah. our mm -hmm. new resource right. there, right. a more equal utilization and being under capacity, mm -hmm. so that as we grow, just we'll, you're you're saying to take advantage of the brick and mortar because right. the two schools have similar capacities. Right. It's just that it's some of it's our K three set more. class size reduction. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Requires it's more a, rooms at the lower grades. I think right. it's a legitimate consideration and one yeah. we can have the, you guys look at when you're yeah. looking at reconfiguration. Right, and, and that, that's a similar response that we've given to people is that the numbers show splitting it three mm -hmm. grades of each, right. but, but that would be a So this, you know, right. this is either an anomaly and three years from now we can do, it could be flip-flopped or this is showing the trajectory of our enrollment where it is really going down I mean these are that's two it's three grades in each school right mm -hmm. right we would expect the three grades to be equal, equal. except Clearly that, they're not except that Curie and Whittier aren't the same size are they I'm not Is I'm not talking about buildings just I'm talking about the number of students class. we're there's it's 130 cool. student difference right and, and so and either it's an anomaly which we, you know three years if it's it could fluctuate and the law of averages will say that it will well where you have a small kindergarten class coming in, and I don't, I, there's no real way to anticipate when that happens. I mean, we all, I think, have yeah. theories when we get a really big one, and you know, people joke, oh, yeah. it's a bad winter, and we've got a lot of kindergarten. I mean, people say yeah. stuff like that, but it just, <laughs> like the way. Well, and it just, it just makes sense when one school is 500 and one school is 750. There's two thirds of capacity at one school versus the other, so grade wise no, configuration, yes. two thirds of. I think so. Yeah. I, I wouldn't even beat the state. dead horse. Yeah. Or if there's a program that we want to, if we have capacity, we can move a program to that school. Yeah, could be. Those are both great ideas. So, so far we've avoided the most difficult 
issue, which is McClintock. So I'd like to hear what my board fellow board colleagues think about that. That's the, the majority of the responses were, or maybe not the majority, but the most responses received were from the McClintock boundaries. And that seems to be our most difficult scenario uh, with what to do with McClintock. So I'm curious to see what everyone feels about that. The, the things that just really were really stood out to me were the 224 kids over in scenario A. I just don't think that we can do that. We reduce that by reducing the boundary of McClintock in some of those, but, and are we committed to not changing any programs? So I, I think that's kind of the elephant in the room, right? Is yes. what do we do about dual language and the, the group that, the two things that came up, I'm kind of stealing your thunder a little bit here, so I apologize. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, the two things that came up really loud and clear around the, from the feedback was, what do we do with dual language and the desire to maintain neighborhood schools? Were the, am I, okay, yeah. Um, so the, the committee, um, Spencer's team collected all that feedback, analyzed it all, analyzed themes, handed that back to the community boundary committee and they met yesterday to look at how do we revise these scenarios to better incorporate the needs and desires of the feedback we received so far. So those, obviously, those are not ready for board consumption or public sharing yet. And we wanted to get your guys's kind of taken input and feedback, just like we did the committees or the communities, to integrate into this process. We felt like now was a good time to do that. So it was relevant. I mean, right now is some choice points for the boundary committee. So the idea was to get some feedback from you, but there are lots of different options being looked at in terms of dual language. We've been asked to look at what would it look like to have an all dual language school in elementary 17, that scenario is being looked at. We have people looking at where do the current dual language students live? What are the configuration or the demographics of the, of the boundary areas under each of the scenarios? Given the demographics of, of the boundaries, what kinds of programs could we either maintain or expand? in um, some of our schools so that we can, you know, maintain programs or expand into to more schools. So there's lots of different options that are being explored in terms of how to accommodate dual language. I think we all desire to make whatever the solution is to be the very least disruptive to kids and families as possible. And, you know, we made a commitment to kids and families about dual language. And so there's a lot of thoughtful consideration that, that's happening around um, um, a dual language. And, you know, I've heard people saying, you know, well, it's going to be tough, and no matter what we decide, people are going to be angry. And I a little bit want to respectfully push back on that comment. I understand that, that it's going to be uncomfortable, but I think our goal is to have as many people as possible comfortable with where their kids are going to school and or at the minimum understand very deeply the, op the rationale for why things are the way they are and feel heard and valued in the process. And so, you know, that's what the committee is doing now. They're really being thoughtful about digging into each individual comment and pushing those comments up about uh, up around scenario or up against scenarios that they're considering. So when we get back together in January, I think as a district staff and the boundary committee will have a, a broader kind of here are the scenarios and solutions that we feel have been fully vetted um, around how to deal with dual language. So is that a? That's good. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I have a lot to say about this, but if anyone else wants to go first, I don't want to take over that conversation, so. I just have a question. These numbers at McClintock, do they include, are they just people living in those boundaries, or do they include the dual language program? It, it includes the migration. And, and interestingly enough, as I dug into the numbers so that I would understand them a little bit better, the number of, of there's a lot of migration happening. The net migration is positive, but not as much as I would have thought. Because there are kids that migrate out for Spectrum, there are kids that migrate to Angelo for bilingual refer to language, excuse me. And, and so they're, they're, they're going elsewhere for other reasons as well. There, there are 
Russian bilingual students that migrate out. So the net migration is accounted for in there to, with the dual language program. Well, I think the piece around a migration factor, it's a factor. When we start to look at specialized programs like the dual language program, it can't just be numbers of kids. It has to be kids who meet a certain kind of criteria so they can participate in the program. So, for example, um, you have to have like a 50-50 split of English language models and Spanish language models. So whatever we do, we have to ensure that we can maintain and sustain the program wherever it is with, with that model. Or if you, and what we're seeing is our Spanish models are not wanting to move out of their, their neighborhood school. So the, the risk or the consideration is to ensure that we can, if we establish like a whole dual language school, can we sustain that over time or do we eventually run out of Spanish language models and not and that starts to erode the program so those are all of the things that that folks are considering and really digging into so it's a very complicated mm -hmm. complex you know, almost kind of have to look at every kid as an individual and where are they going to school and how to best meet their needs and so um, you know the boundary committee members have been amazing at you know dealing with feedback and looking at scenarios and asking the questions and digging in um, thoughtfully responding to each other and, and engaging in social media and then program staff will meet on Wednesday of next week. We have a three hour block to really dig into the details of program sustainability in whatever solution. Because what would be awful is to, is oh yeah, this is gonna work. And then dig down into the details of the program and go, oh my gosh, this thing will erode in three years from now. We're not gonna be able to maintain it. So that's kind of the next layer of program consideration as well. Do, do we have any data on the, the Spanish models not wanting to move, or was that just more anecdotal? Because I'm really. It was very clear in the feedback that um, that Susana got from going out and doing outreach that our the bilingual families that she engaged wanted neighborhood schools. We this year for the first time in the dual language program, um, our staff called individual bilingual families asking them to move over from our schools where they're currently attending non -bound or their boundary schools to go to the dual language program and we've been unable to fill seven spots with Spanish models. And this is the first time, staff is telling me this is the first time in their recollection that that's happened. And it was, it, and the parents are committed enough to where they were saying, if my kid's only option in staying in the bi bilingual program is that they have to go to a school outside their boundary, I will take my kid out of the dual or the bilingual program and I'll have them served in all English. And so we don't want to, you know, I mean, that's a, a difficult spot for parents to be in. Um, and it's, that's a, a new phenomena, is my understanding. And, you know, it, it came through in the, the boundary surveys or the surveys, the guiding principal surveys, and then this happening is, you know, sometimes the, the values of a, a community shift and change. And so, you know, as an organization, we have to, to bend and honor the fact that they've shifted and changed. And so, it just is a complexity that I'm confident that if we dig into and, and we're thoughtful enough around that we can that we can figure out a, a sustainable path forward. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to push back against that a little bit because I don't, I don't think we've had any sort of widespread push to invite them in. It sounds like we just kind of reached out individually or to certain families, but I, I don't remember there ever being a, a wide scale publicity, public affairs, like, hey, we need more students. I certainly never saw it. Um, and so uh, to me, it's still more anecdotal that that's kind of the feedback we got, but, but I don't think there was a widespread uh, push that that was a need and that we were, you know, would evaluate all interested parties. I didn't see it. Did that occur? I mean, I, on the website or through the, it, it, to my recollection and, and the people that I talked to, that didn't occur. It was just more reaching out to individual families that administrators or teachers felt that would maybe qualify or be interested in the program. Is that correct? I don't know that we have done that. Um, in, in my interaction with families um, that I've shared information about the potential boundary changes, I have seen and heard from families um, s sharing that they're looking forward to possibly being back at a school that is closer to where they live. So an example is for you know our, our children who, who live in um, the neighborhood that um, is the Flamingo Village neighborhood, for example. They're excited to potentially be able to um, go to Chess versus where they are right now in Curie, which is pretty far. 
That is what I have heard. We did hear from our survey responses that, you know, the neighborhood school concept was a priority. Um, we can certainly dig into more information regarding the specific question and, br and bring that back to you. Um, yeah, and I, I think even if, the, even if this is a case, I, I'm, uh, I have some other thoughts about that. So I'll, I'll just, I'm just dying to, to talk about this. So, um, so the McClintock, in all the feedback, this is clearly the biggest issue, and so we have to address this. This is the majority of the concern, and, and so you know we really have to address this head on. So in reviewing the feedback uh, and talking to people at the McClintock situation, we're in this scenario that brings back a lot of memories from the uh, Franklin and McClintock uh, boundary discussions. And I was a community member at that time, and essentially we had a meeting in here where there was a large group of the people that lived in the one scenario that, that worked better for them, and another large group, but not as large, where the other scenario worked for them. And since the group that wanted the one scenario was larger, they essentially won out in that sweat. And I, I had proposed a compromise that I thought could have allowed it kind of everyone to be happy, and it wasn't eventually followed, but, and that would have been to decrease the opt-ins. There was a large number of spots being reserved for opt-ins, and the, the feedback was that we want neighborhood schools, and so we have to kind of think outside the box with that, and so I think there's a solution to this one as well. If we look at the guiding principles, the three top-ranked guiding principles for the board, which if we represent the community, and this is what we hear from the community, is neighborhood schools, long-term boundary solutions, minimize impact to students. Those are the top three. And so to summarize that, it would be having neighborhood sc schools that give students and families long-term stability and realistic expectations so that they know where they're going to school. They're not going to be moved four times in five years. or uh, And so that, and they're, they're just, they go to school with their neighborhood. So that, the scenario with dual language at McClintock is very much at odds with this. Mm -hmm. So, and again, I, this is not that someone is better or more important, it's just that that is the principle that, as you both have mentioned, everyone's mentioned, that's the priority for our community, and that is at odds right now with dual language at McClintock. It's just not feasible. So, so we need to, a different scenario. Um, and so these scenarios right now, it's either the neighborhood around McClintock is gonna be very happy and the dual language is gonna be very upset, or the dual language program at McClintock's gonna be very happy and you're gonna have a couple hundred very upset families. And so we need to think outside the box of how we can, like Ms. Whitney said, make it the least uncomfortable for as many students and families as possible. Just, you know, the least disruption, make as many people happy as possible. And I think we can do that. And that would be around making uh, elementary 17 an all dual language school. So, so I went to Fuerza Elementary in Kennewick last week and I met with their principal and vice principal and their principal actually happens to be a former dual language teacher in Pasco mm -hmm. uh, and their model actually is a little bit different than ours they have a 50-50 model with one teacher so essentially the entire school is bilingual and one teacher every class the teacher is bilingual and they just teach them English and Spanish from the beginning so it's a little bit different model mm -hmm. um, and so we, we talked about things, and I'm sure they, are, they would be more than willing to help us address this. And I was very much in favor of this, but the one concern that brought up, well, we don't have enough Spanish models. Well, let's think how else we can, we can do this. If that truly becomes an issue with, uh, with this new, with an all dual language school, um, I think if we do that, it's going to disrupt the least amount of students because it's a brand new school, for one. And so it, would just, it could just open like that. It would make McClintock more... Uh, a better size for that neighborhood in an area where there's still houses being built so that we won't displace those students and um, it would be innovative and exciting and this is what the dual language teachers want this is what the dual language program wants and so I think that's what we really need to look at um, and if we truly run into the to the problem where we don't have enough Spanish models maybe we need to reevaluate that model um, and even have, we could even have a hybrid model where, okay, we have, you know, 80% of the classes are the 80-20 model, but the other ones, if we don't have enough Spanish models, it doesn't matter what the m mix is. I mean, as much as you want some of each, but it could be a 50-50. The teacher is the one that's teaching, and um, it doesn't have to be a perfect mix. Uh, anyways, so those are my thoughts, and that is what I'm in favor of, and I think that's the majority that would make the most people satisfied have the least disruption for students, would really um, uh, make our dual language program happy and give them an opportunity to be innovative and successful at an all dual language school. And to add on to that, I would like 
some of our other schools to become like Fuerza, like Captain Gray, for example, they pretty much already are bilingual school, nearly everyone in that school. Uh, so I think we can start transitioning some of those schools to become like Fuerza, where it's just bilingual, everyone learns two languages. If you go to, say, Captain Gray, every child that from fifth to sixth grade, when they leave fifth grade, they are bilingual. So I'd love you know, to hear everyone else's thoughts. One of the options, I've thought a lot about this as well. One of the options, one, one of the things that we did just before I think you got on the board was we put our dreams on the board. And one of the dreams that came up more than once and was one of mine as well, so other board members shared it, was that we could have every person who wanted to graduate bilingual from PASCO that they could that every parent who wanted their child in the bilingual program could. And I am one of those parents. I think, I think that's what our goal should be. And I think a hybrid is exactly what we need to go toward. But I also think neighborhood schools, loud and clear, came out number one. And by creating a dual language school, you're still busing from all over the area to one school. So why not open? more bilingual schools, classrooms, in more schools. And, but at the same time, maybe leaving those that are still at McClintock or some of these dual language schools there, and then just not having feeder schools in kindergarten. So reducing the amount at, Magla at Angelo to one, and then having one bilingual classroom, whatever. And, but if they're, but my goal is that anybody who wants to, it's not about who gets the best score on a test or whatever. Anybody who wants to can learn English. And it's going to have to be a hybrid because we don't have people who want to move one way or the other. But let's enable everybody and let's educate everybody in the way that they want to. I want, but I want neighborhood schools. I love having my kids close. I love being able to pick them up close. I also want my kids to know Spanish. So I would love to do that. In, and I think it might not just have one solution. I think there might be multiple solutions that can be win, win, and still allowing those kids that are there to stay. And then we might open up with a really big school and it will shrink every year as the bilingual kids graduate from the current program and that program, those programs perhaps can start in schools individually. Yeah, you know, I that's it. In, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I, just, I, I think I, we agree with, I just, I think everything you said, I mean, I'm very much in favor of neighborhood schools and that's this, I think, minimizes the impact of not having neighborhood schools. You know, by doing this, it's, uh, by, if we didn't move it, it's, you're going to not have as much of a neighborhood school as if we moved it. And I, that's the whole purpose of moving it to a new school that hasn't become a neighborhood school. And it's in an area, I mean, this is right by my work, if it's above power line or whatever we want to call that road, there are no school, there aren't very many houses around that school. So by starting it, and, and I, I totally agree with you. I, I agree, I want everyone to have the chance and this is how we're gonna do it, is by starting making these tough decisions and thinking outside the box. It's not gonna happen by us just saying, yeah, we just wanna have it at all the schools. We're gonna have to do some things that are uncomfortable and so this is one of them. Um, I agree, The neighbor. This is, this is because I feel that the neighborhood schools are, are the most important and so neighborhood schools take priority. If you're gonna be in a special program like say Spectrum, you may have to travel, right? So there's people in our neighborhood that go to Spectrum at Livingston and they have to travel. It's not in their neighborhood. Okay, that's the family's choice because they're in that program. And so the neighborhood around the school takes priority because that's, I agree. We all agree, the community agrees, everyone agrees that that should be the, the de facto priority. And if you want something different, then but eventually the goal is, I'm with you, every school, every person that wants to, we should do it. And you know, I think it's gonna happen with a hybrid, not the model system, because that's all the testing that makes it, we don't need to do that. We just have it, everyone that wants to, and then we make sure we have enough teachers. We actually already have um, enough teachers. They may not already be teaching in Spanish, but we have enough that are capable of, if we provided them the opportunity, they could become uh, certified, uh, or they're pretty much already bilingual. They're just maybe haven't been doing that. Um, but I totally agree. I think we're on the same page. That, that's, let's do it, but it's not going to happen if, unless we start doing some of these difficult things. And let's look things. at more than just one scenario. Let's not just look yeah. at a neighborhood school. Let's look at a lot of different scenarios that we could, um, that we could do a dual, dual language yeah. differently because I think everybody on this board wants to expand dual language because we've heard that from the community 
over and over again, we want more dual language. And, um, and I just think there's a lot of different ways we can get there. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, let's look at D, E, and F, because right now this isn't going to do it. See, we're, this doesn't get us anywhere near what we're talking about. So we need D, E, and F, where we're going to look at this scenario. It sounds like the committee is going to do D, E, yeah. and F. They, so yeah, I'm just, so I'm I'm just voicing my support that. Yeah. for that. And that very intentionally, these three boundary, revision, or boundary scenarios that were taken out to the community, very... The committee knew that these were not yeah. going oh, to be, sure. they were a springboard, and so it's been a very intentional process for the committee and to hear from people and then, you know, like it, like um, Spencer said it, you know, he no one was thinking these boundaries would be the ones that, right. oh, we're going to yeah. receive from the very beginning, so. Yeah, so I'm very supportive of that, the, board, the, the committee looking at that, and I'd like to see them combine with our district administration that's been looking at our dual language you know, remodeling or auditing or changing, whatever you want to call it, that they've been looking at. I want them to come together, take the feedback that we're giving right now, which is very much sounds in favor of looking at this and really digging in and, and getting more of those details. And I've talked to, to district staff and they've been planning things like this for a long time. Mm -hmm. So we, they've already pre thought this out before we even got on board because, because we realized we have a problem with the dual language program. It's not offering. And so, some of those, these ideas come from what staff's already come up with. So I think, I think we put this to the committee and we're hopefully gonna get some really good ideas to, to be able to reduce th this problem at McClintock with you know, your scenario, you know, all these different scenarios. I just think there's a lot of different scenarios that can solve this problem and be a win-win. Yeah, I agree. My, my concern is that at, at the last meeting, the district administration seemed to be really not in favor of it because they thought we didn't have enough Spanish models. That was the main feedback that kind of was discouraged, that they didn't think it was possible. And I, I said, if that was the case, I guess we can't do it then, right? But but let's re-look re at that because I think that um, that's somewhat anecdotal. It's never been pushed in the whole community. And also that even if that's the case, we have other options that we can make it happen with a hybrid model like we're talking about. Yep. And I was talking to Sup Superintendent Whitney about this very thing, and she was the one who brought up the hybrid model. So that idea has come out. So I think it's good, and I think it's exactly what direction we'll probably end up going in some kind of hybrid model. So I can tell you I'm not in favor of an all dual language school. I think we're moving away from that. I don't know how far we are from being able to offer, I don't want to call it dual language, but bilingual education in multiple schools. But I think we set ourselves up to just have to make changes down the road if we go with an all dual language school. I'm, I'm not in favor of that. Um, if we really have issues that we can't solve, I mean, I, I don't know what this is going to look like at McClintock. I mean, that, that school is way overcrowded. Um, <clears throat> I know this wouldn't be looked on very favorably, but if we have to not add a dual language class there for the next couple of years till we make these changes, then, and especially if we're having a hard time getting the native Spanish speakers to come and to complete that model, then maybe it's time to curtail that and it will help with some of the crowding till we get a solution that's, that's long-term and workable. But I, I'm not in favor of an, of an all dual language school because I think that then just concentrates it and then we're gonna have a hard time pulling away from that. It just makes sense to me that, that we accelerate where we can, a bilingual model that works in multiple locations that we were I mean we're still two years out from making these changes so there's two well I guess we're opening one elementary this year but are, are you at least open to more information though so right this time that's how you feel but right but if you get feedback from the committee and the district administration could they change your mind by providing you the information? I, I'm not sure they would change my mind on a new all, all dual language school I mean short term that might <coughs> seem like the best option and that may be what they come up with but i don't believe long term that that's the best option especially if we're talking about i mean if we're truly talking about bilingual education across the district then a, an all dual language school doesn't make sense in my mind so i mean i understand it's easy now because we free up mcclintock we free up angelo we concentrate everybody there where the, where everybody's teaching the same thing but to me long term if we're talking about really a bilingual education for all of our students where they are then then doing that just to alleviate short-term pain is not 
is not the best long-term solution. Let me just put this in your mind, and I, um, I don't think it's easy for one. I think it's going to be quite complicated to do, but it's not going to be easy. But if, if our goal is to have uh, bilingual or dual language education at the schools, to me, having a central location where it's kind of your, your headquarters for that makes sense. Right now, we're kind of fragmented. We have this Maya deal, we have the McClintock deal, and they're kind of a little different. They're mostly the same, but but maybe think of it more as a, you know, that's the that's the headquarters. That's where our you know main you know it's all dual. That's where the the first and it, I, it wouldn't be a temporary thing. I would view that as a long term. That's going to be the fuerza or whatever you want to call it. And then from there, then you have the growth where you can kind of let other schools you know add the programs like what what Miss Phillips is talking about, where we're going to hey we're going to provide this opportunity, but we need we need our our core people that have been working on this for years to be together and to kind of define so I, so I don't view it as a short term I, this would be a long term solution to get us to where we're talking about but but you just keep an open mind so. <laughs> you know you. another suggestion too um, looking at Franklin's boundaries um, well in, in scenario B I remember very distinctly talking with the community and there was a lot of discussion last time that we did this over this diagonal that went through this block below Franklin. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of parents very much against that um, because I guess, you know, this whole block, anyway, because it, they felt very divided. I, anyway, which is difficult. Um, up north of McClintock in the blue area, there's, oh, there's a, some, there's 66, it looks like 66 people in that whole northern blue area. And there's the Clark addition that's on the right hand upper side. And then there's a small addition that's on the left hand side of that. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, I wonder if that just isn't more suited to go to the new elementary school. It, um, can I stand up? <laughs> All of the roads right here go out. Nothing goes toward here. They have to bus kids all the way out, down here, all the way around into Franklin, okay? So talk <coughs> about passing elementary school. This one's closer, this one's closer, this one's closer by bus. So I don't know if you're aware of that. I, do the kids here, does anybody know? I've heard that there might be a little road through there their is, farmland. I've driven it. There is a road there. And dirt. Yeah. It's dirt, but the dirt. kids drive yeah. their cars through there. Oh, yeah. Um, so this but one, the bus doesn't go there. But the bus doesn't. So this one might be nice for them to do. This one goes out. And there's, I know there's something through it, but it's really long. And I know that there was some major complaints when kids were going down through there, through this farmland, whatever. But these all go right here. It's going to be so much easier for those parents to get to and from it's, and it would add to a place that has um, that has not enough kids to one that has more because there's still a lot of growth going on here and like I said this area there's no roads this way it only goes this way and it goes toward this so today today uh, yeah, how do today we, right. you're right how do we request or petition the city? How do we make that happen? Maybe that's because I well, did try to drive on that road one time. It's awful. There's still a lot of farmland that is going to be to me. Be it's not city so land. So how do we? Right. So do we work with the county? How do we work to get that paid? You go to the uh, you go to the ground landowner. And say, hey, can you put it right in. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll then we pay for it. I know because of yeah. Let's do it. The work that I'm working on is that the city has in their transportation improvement program. Gilbert Road across here. There's also uh, a subdivision that's not a preliminary plant yet, but it's a key corner from Franklin up here. Okay. So that would naturally stay in Franklin, even with Burns Road straight across. Those people have to come down there and then out but, that way. But there will be there will be a subdivision right here is what I'm trying right. to tell you. But I don't know what the time is. No. They've no. been trying to get it for years, but they can't get it in the urban growth boundary, but the city is revising there. So it just makes sense to keep all of this. I, I still right. think we should look into just this section going this direction. It's probably not a lot of kids, but it's it's ten today. It's ten. But it's gonna grow. Right? <laughs> it's ten here. I don't know many subdivisions right here either, but they do go that direction. So. Right. 
Washington, well, they do have to go clear all the way around to get to school, and they will for the next 10 years, probably at least. Until they burn Burns Road. Until they burn, yeah. Right. Well, even with, yeah, with Burns Road, it'll definitely make it easier. It's not going to make it any closer than the ele other elementary. Yeah, part of, part of the reason why we have for a long time I know it's really hard though because we already have a school there that's already Oh, so overcrowded with Met, with McClintock and Franklin both being some of the most crowded schools. Right. And with that one being so close and equally as accessible or well more accessible currently, it would just it would just solve it would help a little bit for I think the families and the, I don't know I haven't talked to the families but okay. it just makes sense. How many of the McClintock dual language kids live in that boundary? Do we know? 80-something, I believe. I forget the exact number, but I think it was... I heard 30%. Is it It's like a 60, 40 It's 50%, percent. at least. That's what I so... It's a, it's a pretty good number. We'll, we'll get you accurate numbers. Okay. I, I think I think the numbers I saw was more like 40%. Anyway, we'll get you... So if we, if we move the dual language program, would they all move with it? Some, some might like to stay at their neighborhood school. Well, I, that's what I'm wondering. If, if we did move the program, if someone would say, oh, it's been fun. But. but if we grandfathered all those kids in and said, all right, we're just not starting a new kid, or we're only going to do one kid, whatever, and and it's, it's just the kids in this area, I don't know. Yeah. Even if we could... Even if we could open up neighborhood, neighborhood, or, you know, like this group of three schools goes to this school, yeah. this group goes, I mean, I think there's a lot of different scenarios we could use so too. to make it so it's more neighborhood-like, yeah. because that's what we've heard again and again and again. Well, just looking at McClintock, I mean, that, that school is way overcrowded. Now, I know there's, is there, have they built on all the lots that are in the current McClintock boundaries? Is there still? There's there's growth still coming. I know there's commercial no, there's ground out there. Is there still residential? Yeah, right across from McClintock. There's, there's some residential that we built on. Right the across from McClintock is west, not. The eastern half of. That's not McClintock though, right now, is it? I, I think that's Franklin. And it did not show up in the plat information that the city provided. So it, back there where it's going to happen as well just to the north of I mean between Burns and Sandifer correct there's yeah. there's lots that haven't been built on there right can't be too many I thought they built that all out there aren't they waiting for the new Costco to go in there to uh -huh. fill up that commercial property Costco? what that's that's <laughs> old rumor there oh. So, and a Trader Joe's? Yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I keep selling yeah. all those pies. They'll be low. <laughs> I'm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I but love, we, you know. We yeah. definitely don't want to overcrowd McClain Talk. I'm no. just looking at those boundaries, and I think right now it's full with with just where it is. Okay, but the, the issue, and I know they're going to address this with the other scenarios, is like with scenario... Um, B and C, you're you're going to move people that have been moved two, three times. I, I mean, I so we totally cannot do that. I so, so I really appreciate the discussion, but I, I, I do want to point out one thing that we're grappling with a little bit. Okay. As, as, as we have discussed the the new language the 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 issue, we kind of talked around a bunch of different ways to do it. One is the new language program, which we talked about here. Another is the new paper, which we talked about here. A third way would be portable, which I told somebody who said that doesn't make a lot of sense because we bring them in one year and the next year sixth grade would leave and we wouldn't leave them. So that's a, that's a big expense that 
it doesn't make a lot of sense. But that is an option, right? If you, if you don't want to move bigger than four programs. Um, but along with that, a couple of things that's been, I mean, we've been, we've been moving fast with a lot of this data and, and learning things about it. And, and I want to let you know something else that we said is it's not just the 2020 issue. The issue is 2019. Before sixth grade moves, we have to have a, a, at least an iterative answer for a few questions. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. I think for that's just going to be a, yeah, for this it's going to be a painful year. Yeah. Right. And then one other, one other thing that we have, Brian, right, just, just full disclosure here is, I think we showed this boundary for each scenario for 16. And it works great for 2020. But 2019, the sixth grade there, you know, basically open high capacity. So we're, we're thinking that probably these two neighborhoods would remain at, at Livingston that opening, not that you're moving them, you're just keeping them there. You can choose to move them the next year if you want to. So if it just opens at capacity, that's better than any other school we've got. Why is that? There were a few that lived in this neighborhood thinking, well, we bought a house there because we thought we could walk yeah. over it. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. Mm. Trying it out, it's a lot of things. Okay, so. I just want to make sure that you know you understand that we're we're still working on some of those things, and I I appreciate the staff's perspective that says okay we got to absorb all this information a little bit more rather than push to get an answer. There's, there's a ton of information that feedback and your input. We want to look closer and talk to the people who figure out the bus route. and say we see My uh, my quick observation, without looking at all the numbers and knowing all the uh, details and idiosyncrasies that go into each of these, is if I look at our board uh, priorit prioritization of guiding principles, I think they pretty well match the communities. I think all of these scenarios meet the neighborhood schools, the number one priority that we have right here. And when I look at the next two seek long-term boundary solutions and minimize impact students to the extent possible. Um, again, without looking at all the details, I would think that scenario A might do that in that it's painful for the schools like McClintock and Frost that have more that are, that are well over capacity. But as far as looking forward, if we need to go and or when we go build another school, it's easier to impact fewer students if versus in a scenario like B where we have 70 or 80 kids over capacity at a lot of schools. There's there's more moving. Um, it's easier to go and say, okay, well, I know that here's where my problem area is. is these are the areas where I need a new school and we tweak the boundaries around that versus a scenario like B where you have Emerson, Chess, well, Chess doesn't have that many. Frost, where you have 60, 70, 80 kids at each school that's over capacity, it's going to be hard to justify building a new school. And, and once you do, it's going to be a lot of movement again to rebalance. So um, again, I haven't looked at, the, at all the details, but my high level look would be that A would meet our principles the best without getting into the details. One last comment on the, what you shared about the Livingston scenario. So my preference, we, if in that type of scenario, that we allow parent choice, right? That they either choose to stay at Livingston for another year or, or move that year, like in that scenario where we're like, oh, do we keep you there? Do we move you to the school? The, 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 the situation you just described with those two Livingston neighborhoods where it's like, well, do, you keep, do we keep you there for another year? Do we have you go to the new school, even though it's going to be pretty full? To me, that's the perfect scenario where you allow the families to decide. Yeah, and so we, you can and, do either or. Yep, and there's instead been, of forcing one I, or the I other. I remember in the last boundary scenario, I was kind of peripherally attached to it that there were criteria in which some of the kids were, were quote unquote grandfathered yeah, in. Yeah. So it's certainly something that there's been a past practice in, and I think it would just be, you know, considering where that makes sense. And yes. 
One last comment. We didn't have a chance to talk about this, but the portable issue. So we're going to have all these excess portables. I'd like it if, I mean, I don't know what committee, if we want our community builders, but what are we going to do with all those portables? Is there a market to sell them? Can we bring some together? Um, I also last week visited MCP in Kennewick. They're getting a new school yeah. finally, but they've, for 10, mm -hmm. at least 10 years, they've just had a collection of five or six portables. That was their homeschool partnership for 10 years, highly successful, and they're pretty old, the, those portables. So I... We're going to have all these excess portables. Let's put them to use and start meeting our goals of equity but pr by providing more students and families what they need to be successful. Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of us who are kind of chomping at the bit to have those conversations about how can we be innovative with portables should we have surplus. So I think all of the things that you mentioned, there's um, Randy Nunnemaker was able to contact a landowner at Lakeview who may be willing to partner around land if we had a portable to put there for pre-K. I mean, there's lots of innovative partnerships like that that we could have should we be able to provide space. Often when we go for a partnership like that, people are really willing until I say, well, but I need a building. And they're like, oh, well, come back to me when you have a spot. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. And I think, like I said, many of us are, are really excited about having those conversations and certainly um, the community builders group has been established for long-term planning. I think it would be appropriate for them to be involved, um, but I would defer to Susana and her department um, around planning for that and obviously keep the board informed and give them opportunity for helping us prioritize. Okay. Do After you, you get done with the long-term facilities plan and the boundary <laughs> revisions on <laughs> Dr. Reyes. Put so you've, uh, you've got some input from the board. Is there more to your... More discussion? Um, just a little bit of, I think we've discussed, but um, I don't know if there's anything more that uh, Spencer from, I'm going back to the, oops, I'm going back to the slides. Um, I think we've yeah, talked we've about talked that. about these, you know, issues and considerations. And Spencer mentioned we met with the Boundary Committee yesterday, um, exploring revised scenarios based on the feedback and as well we'll continue that work based on today's feedback anything more on that slide Spencer that you want to add uh, probably the only thing I would add is that we're going to come back to you we knew today was going to be kind of a work session we're going to come back mm -hmm. to you and summarize all the public comment okay so that okay. you can you, know, <coughs> you get the big feel for that of how yours fits in with everybody's and and then how we came up with what we come up with for you next time. <laughs> okay. Revised scenarios. Could, could I make a request? Um, can we get a copy either, I don't know if you want to do it for just A, if that's the scenario that the community thinks is best, or all three. I, I guess I'd like to see it for one, maybe scenario A, but in these boundaries, show me how many existing uh, permits are out there to be built in each of these boundaries. And if you already have it, then maybe it. send we'll it in a it. Friday update. Yeah. Okay. You know, if we do do A, I still feel like there needs to be a solution for Frost and McClintock in addition to A, because yeah. Frost is 251 right. over capacity. Right. So we, that includes it's, I think you're almost guaranteed not to see one of these scenarios back exactly the way you see it tonight. <laughs> so I just Right. The, the new scenarios are going to compensate for those, for those things. Okay. The, the numbers you see there move a couple of neighborhoods that used to be in Frost that were moved to Emerson. It moves them back. Well, oh. maybe there's more kids now. <laughs> Different families, right? Um, and so the number is high. So maybe we don't move both of those neighborhoods back. Okay. okay. So we'll follow up with Boundary Committee meetings. We're going to meet again next Thursday, the Boundary Committee. We've just been meeting pretty frequently here lately. We'll, you know, we'll continue to seek additional community input. We'll study program and transportation impacts and seek efficiencies there, provide board updates. And then um, we are adjusting the timeline based on the work as it has developed, trying to be very thoughtful, make sure that we, you know, are thorough in our analysis and that what we present as final uh, recommendations are as fully vetted as possible and impact the least number of our um, students and children as possible in terms in, in a in a fashion that won't make them as happy. So we want to do the best that we can for everyone. 
Um, the adjusted timeline, we know Three Rivers opens in August of 2019, so we would like to uh, finalize that right around the January, February uh, timeframe. And then the boundaries for Columbia River Elementary, Middle School 4, and Stevens um, take our time to, again, do a, a, a full analysis and maybe by March or April at the very latest is, is our hope. Okay. Okay. So if I may, if you are part of the boundary committee, if you could just stand and be recognized by the board. I'm sorry, I know you hate to do it, but please. Be recognized it, yes. by everybody yeah. watching yeah. on yep. YouTube. Sorry, sorry. Thank Can you. we? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Raquel, do you serve on the committee as well? She does. Yes. Okay. Yes. She's, she was I just want to be duly she noted that she was refusing to stand at the <laughs> superintendent's request. <laughs> I just wanted to acknowledge our boundary committee members. They've been super diligent under Susana's uh, leadership in partnership with Spencer. And while they're meeting a lot, they're also doing a lot of work outside of the meetings. And so I just wanted to personally thank you and acknowledge your efforts on our behalf and let you know how much we appreciate your just diligent, diligent effort around this initiative. It's a huge impact to our community. We appreciate it. Yes, thank you for your time. Their, their insight is it, amazing. Is invaluable, yeah. Yeah. really, because they're, they deal with it every day. I, mean, I really appreciate the, the conversations that they have and the issues that they bring up. It's been great for the process. So, and on behalf of the board, thank you. This makes our job a lot easier to to uh, get some input from you guys to know what your feelings are, and you've spent more time on looking at these things than we do. So, as a board, we certainly appreciate your work there. So, thank you, and we'll look forward to for more updates. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Hayes.